Um, welcome to the Strand Bookstore. We're 85 years old and still independent. And I am Jessica Strand, the events director. And no, I'm not related to the Bass family. It is just a coincidence. And I did not change my name to get this job. Um, tonight we're here to discuss, this was sort of fun to write and I never write anything because I don't believe in introductions, but the, cult, the cultural history of rabies, the virus that turns us, I was actually looking at the blurb and I'm, it turns us into frothing, tooth bearing monsters, the virus that kills nearly 100% of its victims, the virus that has sparked our imaginations from the ancient Greeks onward with myths, vampires, zombies left in its rabid wake. I thought, oh, fantastic. Who better to assess this subject than the authors of our new book? Rabid, Bill Wa Wasik, am I saying? Wasik and Monica Murphy. Bill Wasek is a senior editor at Wired. He writes on technology and media, and Monica Murphy has degrees in public health and veterinary medicine. So please join me in welcoming Monica Murphy and Bill Wasek. Um, I will come, but they are going to do a 30-minute presentation, and then there'll be a Q&A after, and then we will have a book signing. Thanks. All right, we'll try not to... Uh overwhelm you too much with our presentation, but we think there are a lot of things that's very important for you to know about rabies and the history of rabies. Um, but first of all, thank you so much to The Strand for having us. Um, we're very excited to be here surrounded by all these rare books. Um, Monica noticed that the projector is actually being held up by a stack of books that have price tags of $1,000 on them, <laughs> which, I, I mean, is that's, you know, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, right? Um, so, um, so we will begin. So um, again, uh, here is the book. You've probably already seen it. Um, so the theme of our presentation is possession. It's a very scary idea, and we'd like to begin by warning you that possession is all around you. Be afraid. For example, just in the past month alone, um, so uh, uh, on July 2nd uh, in Florida, we had an incident. There was a teenager who had recently adopted a small dog, and she noticed at her window that the dog was being menaced by a fox. She ran out to intervene. She, she chased the fox. She grabbed the fox. She tried to strangle the fox. Um, she, she tried banging the fox's head against the pole. And when none of that was working, she ran back inside the house and got a big knife from the kitchen and went out and stabbed the fox twice. And still, it, it kept after her and her dog. It wasn't until the police got there and shot the fox that the fox was, was stopped. Uh, and then we had another uh, equally terrifying incident in Maryland. Uh, this woman uh, lives in a, in a dwelling behind the Jolly Roger liquor store. She got up early one morning to let her Yorkshire Terrier outside and was greeted by a deer who rose up on its hind legs and boxed her about the face with its hooves. Um, and then uh, in Lake Anna, Virginia. These two girls were beginning a vacation with their father that was to last one week, but uh, Beaver intervened uh, while they were swimming in the lake and, and inflicted some serious injuries on their legs. Um, and then finally, this very, very diabolical incident from Vermont. <laughs> A woman and her son approached the town dump in their pickup truck and were greeted by a cat. The woman got out to talk to the cat. She was an animal lover. The cat leapt up, bit her mouth from the ground, and uh, then ran off to, to bite her son, who, who was cowering inside the truck. They, they managed to get, kick the cat out of the truck and drive away as the cat chased them down the, the driveway to the dump. Um, the next day, the cat was sighted at a nearby junkyard um, that was two miles away. Uh, when it leapt onto the back of the junkyard pit bull, uh, it was subdued with a shovel and a gun. So... For those of you who are here, uh, you know exactly what the agent of this possession is, but here you can see it in a very pretty image from the Pasteur Institute. This is the rabies virus particle. The virus actually acts on the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that, uh, that houses a lot of our animal passions, uh, desire, rage, terror. Um, they're all here in this primitive part of the brain. And uh, this very sort of unique uh, virus has some interesting, unique symptoms. 
these, uh, these include uh, periods of hyperexcitability and terror um, in, interspersed with lucid periods in which the victim can, can fully realize how, how awful it is to be dying of rabies. Um, oh, we met, we, I realized we, uh, we also forgot hydrophobia. That's an important one to mention, right? Um, which is that uh, the virus causes an inability to swallow, um, which manifests, which, which begins to manifest as this visceral fear of fluids. I mean, you'll see uh, you present just a cup of water to someone, and even though they're thirsty, they bring it to their lips, and their body begins to rebel um, just because they are you know, going to be incapable of swallowing the fluids. And uh, after reaching the brain, the, the virus actually travels back down the nerve fibers to the salivary glands, where salivation is ratcheted up, and the saliva itself contains millions of copies of, of the virus ready to infect someone else. Hello. Um, so what, what you end up with is uh, a rabies victim who is fully primed to communicate rabies to others. Uh, you know, wild with, with rage and terror and passion and, and salivating out a ton of virus. Um, so I'll uh, walk you briefly through a few instances of rabies and culture. There are a lot more to talk about, but um, just to give you a few. Um, so uh, in the introduction, she mentioned the ancient Greeks. Um, you know, one of the really interesting things that uh, you see in ancient Greek is that the word, the medical word for rabies, which is lissa, um, actually appears in literature as a term for this kind of wolfish rage that will prompt, uh, often prompt warriors to deeds of sort of total savagery. Um, in a couple of Euripides dramas, um, Lyssa is what goads Heracles to kill his family. It prompts Pentheus' own family to dismember him. Um, and here on the left of this image, you can see Lyssa personified as this figure in a dog's head cap. Um, in the Iliad, uh, it's a sort of pivotal moment when Odysseus goes to uh, try to prompt Achilles to get back into the fight. Um, he begins to talk about Hector and sort of all the terrible things that Hector's done on the battlefield. Um, and, and here Hector is portrayed as being possessed by this sort of Lyssa. And the idea is that it's both uh, the force that allows Hector to be such a, uh, a fiend on the battlefield, but it's also a source of vulnerability to him. It's like a rage that is so intense that it borders on a kind of madness. Um, you know, just this last sort of etymological point is that in the construction of the sentences, it's actually unclear whether the, whether the person has Lyssa or the Lyssa has the person. So this sort of idea of possession is sort of intrinsic in the way that the, the word is used. Um, so the very word rage um, from the French uh, first appears, uh, you know, around about 1100. There's an example from the Song of Roland and that, you know, Lorage uh, is just like with Alyssa, is simultaneously appears as a term for rabies and a term for this sort of mortal hate. Um, you know, an, another interesting dimension of, uh, or, or sort of one of the through lines in the book that is sort of it's hard to get to in any length here, but um, it, you know, Lissa all, often appear. Or I'm sorry, rabies often appears sort of throughout the millennia in pop culture or pop culture in, in literature as <laughs> right as a um, is sort of symbolizing the the dark side of the dog. You know, the dog is this utterly familiar, sort of the most familiar of all creatures, um, but rabies sort of represents uh, the fact that it is sort of the most dangerous in part because we let it get the closest to us. And in fact, even today where a lot of different creatures can carry rabies, dog rabies um, and dog bites are still responsible for 99% of rabies fatalities. Um, and that's probably in part because the dog's strain of rabies uh, is likely more deadly to us. Um, nobody knows for sure, but it's also because um, our dogs live so closely to us, and when we get a dog bite, we aren't necessarily sure. Unlike with a fox, you know, pro tip, if a fox runs and bites you, you should definitely get a rabies shot. Um, but with a dog, you never know for sure. I mean, it might just be defending its space, and so that's part of why, uh, you know, dogs wind up uh, being so much of the um, rabies fatalities. Um, 
to sort of jump pretentiously through history, um, there's a lot of really interesting rabid imagery in Wuthering Heights, um, both, at the, both at the very beginning when the narrator first appears at Wuthering Heights and uh, he's greeted by this sort of throng of very, very vicious dogs um, that uh, sort of eventually send him packing. Um, and then uh, in, a, in a sort of even more weird and twisted way, uh, near the very end, the final embrace of Heathcliff and Catherine is observed as, as like so by um, the, uh, I guess it's the, the nurse or the, the, the second narrator where she says, Catherine made a spring and he caught her and they were locked in an embrace from which I thought my mistress would never be released alive. He gnashed at me and foamed like a mad dog and gathered her to him with greedy jealousy. Um, in sort of getting into the uh, you know Victorian era, you have all of this rabies imagery where it's both this kind of animal savagery, but also a certain kind of uh, you know sexual animal passion. Um, and in fact, uh, a, a you know not entirely common, but also not unusual symptom of end stage rabies infection is actually hypersexuality, where patients will develop. Um, you know, unwanted arousal and sometimes involuntary orgasm. Um, you know, the, the Victorian era is also when um, the uh, the sort of vampire myth sort of comes out of, or has, has come in the, in the 18th century out of uh, Eastern Europe, but the sort of vampire literature begins to develop in the 19th century. And, um, and here again, you have this certain rabid aspect to it. Um, Varney the Vampire, which was one of these sort of penny dreadful serials um, in the mid 19th century, uh, is this interesting hinge point because you have these two very key and very rabid elements of the vampire myth that be, sort of become codified here, where one of them is this fixation on the vampire's teeth as being somehow animalistic, uh, you know, uh, hideously, glaringly white and fang-like. Um, and then you also have vampire contagion, which was not at all the sort of typical feature of um, of the sort of uh, Eastern European vampire folkloric tales, uh, here becomes sort of a standard piece of the vampire myth, where at the end the female victim is transformed into a vampire, and you have you know this act of vampirism as a saliva-born contagion, um, much like rabies. Um, so, on the subject of the malevolent bite and how it works, back to you. Rabies virus enters the body at the, the site of the bite wound. Uh, it, it replicates in the tissues there and then begins its slow travels up the nerve fibers toward the brain. And the, the consequence of, of this route, which is, is not unique to rabies, but is very rare in the virus world, um, is that the latency period, the period of time between when the savage bite occurs and, and when the victim becomes rabid himself uh, it is actually related to the distance of, of the bite from the brain. S thus a, a bite on the neck uh, would, would result in a, a rabies infection relatively quickly uh, whereas it might take many months for the bite on, on the toe uh, to, to result in infection. The, uh, the, the fact of this long latency period uh, created an opportunity for Louis Pasteur, who, who was developing vaccines for the first time in the laboratory. He, he worked on anthrax and chicken cholera and, and was looking to, to prove his methodology to the world with a, a really um, awesome human vaccine, one that would really, really impress everyone with, with the, uh, the correctness of his methodology. And, and he looked at, at rabies as, as really perfect to, to showcase his new vaccine method. And, and he um, realized that not only is, is rabies a super scary disease that makes headlines all the time and thus would attract a lot of attention to the vaccine, but also because of the long latency period, here was an opportunity to vaccinate after exposure to the virus. So the, uh, the rabies victim or the victim of the rabid bite terrified, worried about the signs that may show up uh, days or weeks or months later, have the opportunity to get vaccinated at that point and not get the virus further down the line. Um, 
So we, we do have a couple of uh, brief readings from the book. So at this point, uh, Monica is going to read a bit of the chapter on Louis Pasteur, um, which I believe is the section, here you can go over here and done, um, which is the section that uh, involves his his administration of the rabies vaccine to the very first patient, a young boy. Human patients. It was the destiny of Joseph Meister, a boy of nine, to provide Pester with a sufficiently compelling experimental case to deploy his fledgling vaccine. While walking alone to school on the outskirts of his small Alsatian village, Meister was viciously attacked by a grocer's dog. The animal knocked him to the ground and tore at his flesh while he cowered, holding his hands over his face in vain. By the time a nearby bricklayer reached the scene and fended off the dog with two iron bars, Meister had suffered 14 penetrating wounds to his thighs, legs, and hand. Later that day, after cauterizing the bite wounds with carbolic acid, Meister's local physician sent the boy to distant Paris for consultation with the famous Louis Pasteur. Pasteur proceeded cautiously. He was touched by his initial meeting with the stricken boy and his mother, but did not agree to treat Meister until he had conferred with Alfred Volpin, one of France's most respected physicians and a member of the government's official commission on rabies, and Jacques-Joseph Granchet, the head of the pediatric clinic at the Paris Children's Hospital. The two esteemed medical men agreed that experimental treatment with Pasteur's vaccine would offer Meister his best hope for survival given the extremely grave nature and severity of his wounds. Volpin and Granchet provided not only an ethical sounding board for Pasteur, but also very necessary practical assistance as he proceeded with his trial. Louis Pasteur had never been trained as a doctor, did not have a medical license, and so was prohibited from holding the syringe as it administered the first modern laboratory vaccine for humans, even though he himself had overseen every aspect of its creation. Meister received his first injection immediately. On the 6th of July, at 8 o'clock in the evening, 60 hours after the bites of 4th July, and in the presence of doctors Volpin and Grinchet, we inoculated into a fold of skin over young Meister's right hypochondrium, half a provost syringe of the spinal cord from a rabbit dead of rabies on the 21st of June, recorded Pasteur in his laboratory notebook. The full 10-day treatment would consist of 13 inoculations, all delivering post-mortem spinal tissue from a rabid rabbit. Each successive injection would contain a section of cord that had been exposed to air for a shorter time than the one before it, so that as the series proceeded, the vaccine would become less attenuated. Throughout treatment, Meister and his mother were housed adjacent to Pasteur's lab at Collège Roland. While Meister made himself happily at home among the laboratory chickens, rabbits, guinea pigs, and mice, Pasteur's dauntless confidence in the rabies vaccine wavered as the inoculations he dispensed became more and more virulent. My dear children, began a letter from Madame Pasteur, your father has had another bad night. He's dreading the last inoculations on the child, and yet there can be no drawing back now. The boy continues in perfect health. On July 16th at 11 o'clock in the morning, Meister received his final inoculation. This preparation contained the most virulent tissue of all, rabid spinal cord from a dog that had been infected with the strain of rabies virus maximally strengthened by serial passage in the rabbit and harvested only one day prior to vaccination. Such a dangerous inoculation would provide a convincing test of Meister's immunity. A naive recipient of this shot would be expected to show signs of rabies within several days. Pasteur's son-in-law describes the fateful occasion as tense. Cured from his wounds, delighted with all he saw, gaily running about as if he had been on his own Alsatian farm, little Meister, whose blue eyes now showed neither fear nor shyness, merrily received the last inoculation. In the evening, after claiming a kiss from dear Monsieur Pasteur, as he called him, he went to bed and slept peacefully. Pasteur spent a terrible night of insomnia. In those slow, dark hours of night when all vision is distorted, Pasteur, losing sight of the accumulation of experiments which guarantees its success, imagined the little boy would die. Shortly afterward, Pasteur left Paris for a much needed rest and relied upon frequent updates from the physicians still monitoring Meister to reassure him of his successful treatment. On August 3rd, Pasteur wrote to his son from Arbois, Very good news last night of the bitten lad. I am looking forward with great hopes to the time when I can draw a conclusion. It will be 31 days tomorrow since he was bitten. Um, so, uh, if you get vaccinated, then um, you won't, before the symptoms appear, the neurologic symptoms appear, then you won't get rabies. Um, however, if you don't get vaccinated, 
things are grim. Um, it's nearly 100% fatal, um, which is the, uh, even though a few patients have survived um, under this experimental treatment protocol, it is the highest case fatality rate for any disease. Um, so the idea of the malevolent bite um, is sort of interested, interesting to trace it into the, the zombie uh, fiction of our current day. Um, you know, the the template for the sort of current zombie epidemic genre was actually set by what was nominally a vampire book, which is uh, I Am Legend. Um, he called his uh, his undead creatures vampires, um, but it was a similar kind of po post-apocalyptic, you know, there's a virus that wipes people out, um, and, uh, and the virus does have some sort of similar, some rabies-like symptoms, uh, including infecting the hero's dog. Um, by the time you get to the movie version of I Am Legend, which I can play just a few uh, minutes of, um, you know, where, I don't know, you probably can't see it, but, uh, you know, Will Smith is, uh, uh, his his own dog gets infected and he sort of um, watches as his dog becomes increasingly more aggressive and his teeth lengthen into fangs and he begins to snarl and so Will Smith actually has to put down what is his, his last friend on earth. Um, a very sort of rabid moment. Um, uh, you know, with, with uh, 28 days later, um, the very virus is called the rage virus. Um, and in fact, Danny Boyle has said that uh, he based his virus on rabies or hydrophobia. And he sort of loved the idea that you have this virus that creates anger, but that also is um, the source of a sort of profound fear in um, in its victims, which on some level feels like you know the essence of horror. Uh, however, there is, unlike rabies, a very short latency period, which seems to be about a second in uh, in 28 days later. Um, so, with that, we will open the floor up to questions. Does anybody have any questions about read. rabies? Oh, oh, right. I'm sorry. I was going to read one one last bit. Okay, sorry. Um, you have a moment to think about your question. Yes, to think about your question. So I just want to read one uh, bit from the, en the end of the introduction. Um, so, by now, it should be apparent that this book is not for the squeamish or weak need. Encounters with rabies have ever been thus. Louis Pasteur and his assistants, in order to develop their vaccine, had to corral dogs at the apex of their madness and extract deadly slaver from their snarling jaws. One Swedish physician once saw Pasteur perform this trick with a glass tube held in his mouth as two confederates with gloved hands pinned down a rabid bulldog. Some members of his team soon established a ghoulish failsafe for these procedures. At the beginning of each session, a loaded revolver was placed within their reach, recalled Mary Krasak, the niece of Pester's collaborator, Emil Roux. If a terrible accident were to happen to one of them, the more courageous of the two others would put a bullet in his head. We cannot claim so much bravado for this volume on either our account or yours. A better analogy, perhaps, is the difficult process by which veterinarians submit suspect pets for rabies testing. Another case study in how this diabolical disease causes nothing but agony for those who behold it. Even, even today, vets cannot use a blood test for rabies in animals. It's not a pinprick and wait and see affair. Only a sampling from the brain will suffice. Therefore, the animal must be killed with its head removed and shipped off to authorities for study. The first part of that process, capturing and humanely dispatching an animal, is fairly standard stuff for your local vet. But carrying out a decapitation, even of a smallish creature, is much harder than they make it look in slasher pics. The cadaver is laid out on its back, contorted face canted skyward. With a scalpel, the vet slices readily through the soft tissue around the animal's neck, fur and skin, muscles and vessels, esophagus and trachea. Now the vet is stuck with the problem of the spine, the very conduit through which the rabies virus may or may not have passed. Like Schrodinger's cat, the animal must be dead for this question to unravel. If the vet is lucky, her hospital has seen enough suspected rabies cases that it is thought to keep a hacksaw handy. If she is not so lucky, she will have only her scalpel to work with. 
A five-minute job can thereby stretch out to 20 as she is forced to disarticulate those two top backbones, severing the tendons that bind them and separating one from the other. A decidedly grisly brain teaser. To be honest, our tour through the 4,000-year history of rabies has felt a little like that. Sometimes whole weeks got lost in a blur of blood and fur. Our exploration into the cultural meaning of rabies took us deep into the gruesome medical case reports from ancient and modern times. Then it flung us out again into the murky realm of myth to dog-headed men and zombie mobs and the mass butchering of Cairo's pigs. We've made pilgrimages to the Ardennes to see the site of the Holy Rabies Cure, to the Rue de Holm in Paris to behold the humble building where Pasteur performed his heroics, and to the island of Bali where we finally came to stare the devil in the face ourselves. Now, after two years of sawing, we feel we have finally finished the job, and we are pleased to ship it off to you, the reader. Come to think of it, in the case of a fox, or a cat, or even a toy breed dog, the severed head might weigh just about the same as the book you hold in your hands right now. Hold it in your outstretched palms, why don't you, and close your eyes. Not so very heavy, is it? And yet, from packages this small, considerable mayhem can be unleashed. Thank you. All right, you guys must have questions about rabies. All right, Matt Power. Uh, Bill, what, what, uh, if you had to pick a celebrity to die of rabies, <laughs> oh, to maximize book sales. I don't know. I wouldn't wish death. I wouldn't wish death by rabies on on anybody. You know, like. There are those, especially older celebrities who really love the little pets. You know, like Betty White. Or, or, or is Bob Barker still alive? Because <laughs> I mean, Bob Barker, right? He's a, and Barker. I mean. <laughs> I mean, and then Mary Kate and Ashley. Okay. Um, next question. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, here in front. Um, I was wondering uh, what the inspiration was for the book. What would you want or both of you to go, hey, that'd be a really interesting book because I think it's a really interesting idea for a book, but I can't imagine thinking of it myself. Well, you don't live with a veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so, so, you know, Monica got me interested in rabies. Yeah, even though, <laughs> and I'll try to get you interested. It wasn't like we met where we were like, okay, Cupid says you like rabies and I like rabies. No, that wasn't, that wasn't how it happened. Right. Um, no, even though North American small animal veterinarians very rarely come across rabies in practice, uh, we're, we're taught a lot about it in school, and... Um, you know, I think collectively we take very seriously our duty to protect humans and animals from this terrible virus. But there are, uh, meanwhile, lots of, of sort of deliciously horrifying rabies stories coming over the, you know, veterinarian infectious disease wires every day. And so uh, sharing these with my husband resulted in a book idea. Yeah, and... Um, you know, I, I started thinking about just sort of how kind of amazing of a virus it is. Um, and, and actually, another thing that was influential was um, Carl Zimmer, the uh, science writer, wrote this wonderful book called Parasite Rex, um, which is a book about sort of different pathogens that cause their hosts to change their behavior in such a way that they help to spread the pathogen. Um, and I think he writes a little bit about rabies, and he's, he's mostly writing about parasites. About but, parasites. Um, Jason, yeah. but the point being that, that it, you know, thinking of rabies in those terms was, was really interesting. Um, and and then I started to think about just the, the way we, we use the word rabid, you know, which is the disease, this sort of terrible, terrible disease, and yet we use that word to, uh, to describe like a rabid Justin Bieber fan or whatever. And it's just like, it's, and, and, and then to, to do research and to realize that you have those kinds of metaphorical spinning offs from rabies in all these different languages. I mean, people, since the book came out, we don't really write much about Spanish here, but since the book came out, people were sort of talking about the way that people in Spanish will you know, say some, somebody's like rabioso or that. You know, um, and so it's, it's pretty much across cultures that this terrible disease has these, these cultural connotations that aren't just anger, but this kind of 
just foaming at the mouth sort of avidity for something. And so, uh, and I couldn't, I, I sort of imagined that there, someone must have written a cultural history of rabies, and when they hadn't, it just sort of seemed like such a fun project for us to collaborate on. Uh, in the back. I think it's been a concern, even as it's, humans have never been a terrifically effective uh, vector for rabies. Our teeth aren't bitey enough, even if the passion's there. Um, but, um, and, and we did visit a hydrophobia hospital in, in, yeah, Spain, in Spain, yeah. where you could sort of imagine that scene playing out. But, but you know, most of rabies that's happening today is happening in the developing world. And so there are communities that are still faced with this problem where, where people are presenting with clinical rabies and they have to treat them or, or at least make them comfortable uh, without putting their staff at terrific risk. And that often involves um, either physically or chemically restraining the patient, which means you either, you either drug them or in the absence of drugs, you might tie them down. It's, there are case reports of this, certainly, but I, I don't gather that um, even as, as rage manifests in the human being, that the impulse translates through the human mind into bitey behavior. You know, it, there's definitely a ferociousness among, among yeah, rabies Yeah, like aggression patients. is something that's reported, but I mean, when I we become aggressive, we don't sort of, yeah. You. Exactly. Yeah. Can you speak for a minute about the transmission of rabies by organ transplantation? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's not in the book, but it's something we've, we've read about. Yeah. So yeah, there, there have been a, a couple cases of, of this. One was in North America, and it was responsible for several rabies cases a few years back. Was it 2004? Do you know? 2004. I think so, too. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the, the patient died of a unknown uh, encephalitis, so they didn't track down the origin of, of the encephalitis signs, but um, like a lot of patients that die of, of brain disease, they, they had apparently healthy organs uh, that could be harvested for transplant. And so, so tragically, they, they actually used several organs from, from the patient who died in uh, people around the country. And, and the rate of, of rabies infection in these people were quite high because not only did they have a rabid organ um, put right inside their bodies, but they are on immunosuppressive drugs, of course, and so the, the likelihood that they'd come down with rabies after that was highly significant. Um, there was a, a case in Europe, too, of corneal transplant resulting in rabies um, that I believe resulted in at least two cases. Um, and so it's, uh, it is, you know, it, it's much discussed whether there should be widespread screening of rabies. Um, not only in transplants, but in transfusions um, under certain circumstances. But, you know, in North America, rabies is such a rare disease, resulting in an average of, of under five deaths per year um, these last few decades that, that it, to, to most observers, doesn't seem cost-effective to, to do a, a ton of screening for it. Anything else? Josh? Our book's editor, by the way, Josh Kendall. There. <laughs> book's editor, <laughs> Well, this is uh, what you might call rabies season. Um, so the wildlife are out, the people are out, um, and there's more contacts between wildlife and wildlife and wildlife and people, so there's more opportunities for things like this to happen. But, a, you know, a, a summer month, I, I get lots of stories like this in my Google Alerts and listservs and stuff, um, and, and uh, we did seem a little extra lucky last month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I apologize if this is out of left field. Um, are you familiar with and if so, opinion on the theory 
Yeah, we discuss it in the book. Um, so the question was about uh, the theory that Edgar Allan Poe uh, died of rabies. Um, so rabies was never suspected in Poe's death. Um, there were, he, he gave no report of an animal uh, exposure. Um, but back in the late 90s, I think it was, sort of on a lark, there was this doctor in, uh, or there was, there was this hospital that, that was doing rounds in Baltimore um, or somewhere in Maryland, and they, they sort of as a joke kind of took took off all the distinguishing features and, and the time period of Poe's death and essentially put it into rounds as a unexplained uh, case of, uh, you know, an unexplained death. And um, this one doctor developed a very strong theory that Poe had died of rabies. And the reason was that um, he presented in this sort of, you know, feverish sort of hallucinatory state and this condition, um, it, it, so a lot of people have thought, well, Poe died from essentially the complications of terrible alcoholism or, you know, he sort of drunk himself to death. But the problem with that theory is that um, in situations where that happens, it's usually a sort of steady, slow descent to death. But what actually happened in Poe's case was he had, as, as Monica described, these periods of lucidity where he seemed, where sort of like the hallucinations were gone and he seemed to be... Um, uh, slightly better, but then he would relapse again. Um, and so, um, and so he developed this theory that Poe had rabies, and we'll never really be able to know for sure, but it's a sort of, it's a sort of neat story. Um, all right, somebody else, come on. Oh, Evan, yeah. You mentioned that, like, nothing is more fatal than, than rabies, or no virus, I'm not sure what Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I think that at the, at the height of AIDS, I think AIDS, I mean, w the, the full syndrome had a number like 90 or something like that. And yeah, Ebola, well, there was just something about this today, right, because there's this Ebola outbreak going on where I think one strain of Ebola has something like 80 or 90 percent. Yeah, but another has 60. Yeah. It's still really bad. Yeah. It's really not good. Don't get Ebola. What about those what about those encephalitis, you know, like the, the meningitis or thing that's like once the virus if the virus gets into the wrong place they can be like really terribly fatal. No. Yeah. Um, but part of what's interesting about rabies too is that is that even if Nipah, you, Nipah virus, Hendra viruses mm -hmm. are all yeah, above. Nipah the, that was the one that they, around 80, they based Contagion that uh, Steven Soderbergh movie vaguely on on that one. Um, those are the greatest hits. Yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely, I, I think it's, it's definitely all. It, I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of rich stuff to write about with that particular with the with the the sort of 19th century um, London, Paris, um, the, the U.S. cities to a lesser extent, but it's like you have. Um, um, urbanization, which is sort of bring more people into areas where, you know, feral dogs can infect lots of people. Um, you do have the beginning of a sort of pet keeping tradition. Um, part of what, you know, uh, so one interesting corollary to this, the, the bit about rabies as a, as a almost sort of sexual disease is that there was actually this theory developed in the 19th century that actually became very popular even among veterinarians that rabies in dogs was caused by uh, a, uh, a lack of access to uh, sex, basically, that, that now that we were keeping these dogs as pets and stopping them from, you know, rutting with one another in the streets, that, that the dogs that, that were essentially, that sexual repression would cause these dogs to spontaneously develop rabies. And this is a very, very popular theory that got a lot of, uh, I mean, literally scientific credence. Um, and it was, and it was, wound up being a big impediment to people who correctly understood rabies as being a, a contagious disease. It wound up being an impediment to public health efforts because you had a camp of 
of people saying we've got to keep you know, keep, when you have a rabies outbreak, everybody's got to keep their animals inside. And then other people saying, well, you know, to hell with that. Like, they've got to be out there, you know, doing it in the streets, like, or else there's going to get more rabies. And so, um, but again, it's sort of bound up with this, this as, as the sort of tradition of pet keeping increases, in, in, increases and um, dogs become this kind of bourgeois sort of, uh, uh, I don't want to say a lifestyle of it, it's like they become sort of on the first steps to what they are now, which is like members of our family, um, that's sort of beginning at that point and the unnaturalness of that is clearly bound up with a lot of people's ideas about rabies. Yeah. Um, over there. An old virus? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm not... Uh, we, there are, refer there are clear references to rabies in history going all the way back to the Sumerians. Um, does that make it older than the other, a lot of the other viruses that we have? I mean, uh, not necessarily. Um, you know, we can do at this point, you know, phylogenetic dating on viruses and find that a lot of them are, are have, have been with us for a long time. Um, so I, I, I don't know. But the results on rabies are sort of confusing, the phylogenetic studies. Uh, dog rabies, which has been in uh, historical documents, like Bill says, going all the way back to when we first started writing, um, they're sort of contradicted by this uh, genetic clock evidence that seems to suggest that, that uh, dog rabies um, emerged from bat rabies, you know, only... A, Maybe 1,500 years ago, yeah, so we don't can't, can't we don't know right, if they're so, just wrong yeah. or if uh, dog rabies emerged more than once or went through a genetic bottleneck right there. Um, but anyway, I, I, but I think the question was more sort of like, we talk about rabies as an old virus and what does that really mean? And I guess what I'm, I, like, I think that there's, there's a lot of, there's evidence of it, there's, there's stuff to write about, essentially going back through all of human history. Um, but, you know, there are people who have written books about smallpox where they, you know, find really interesting evidence from the Egyptians that show the weird, like, carbuncular patterns on the, the mummies or that kind of thing, you know? So, so on some level, uh, can we really say that it's older than other viruses? I'm not necessarily sure, but we do know that we've been living with rabies for sort of as long as we've been writing about anything. And so it's kind of, it, it, it makes for a nice sort of fun, like uh, little bits of history sort of parceled out in dribs and drabs that we've sort of tried to bring together into this book. Yeah. Okay. How have um, the various uh, religions tried to confirm you? Like, in, um, like you know, ancient Egypt, ancient you know, so in some of the Greek myths, you see uh, you see the um, the at least Lissa, or at least the kind of metaphorical nature of rabies, kind of incorporated into the order of things in a little bit. You know, the idea that that the um, the savage wolf that can sort of bite you, and infect you, and kill you that, that uh, is is kind of part of the plan. Um, interestingly, the Christian tradition, or I mean, beginning with the Judaic tradition, there's, I mean, if you look at the Bible, the, the dog is not a very uh, well-loved creature, you know, and so uh, as sort of Christianity becomes ascendant, you have a lot of um, uh, really negative connotations with the dog, and rabies is, is sort of appears as this kind of possession. I mean, there's this really interesting, um, like, Coptic text from, like, 4th century Egypt um, that is not in the book, but that uh, there's this saint, like Saint Tarabo or something like that, who uh, has his own... Um, he, he's the he's the, the sort of guy you pray to against rabies. And interestingly, like, Margaret... Uh, Mead, I think Mead, one of those, the anthropologist, uh, was when she, she visited Egypt in the early 20th century and was bit by a dog, they actually performed the cure of St. Tarabo on her. So that, so this had, had, among the cops, had survived for, like, you know, 2,000 years. And don't forget St. Hubert. Well, right. And so, so what we write about in the book is we go to, to St. Hubert, uh, which is both the town in Belgium and also the name of the patron saint of rabies sufferers through, throughout sort of more like medieval and early modern Christianity. And uh, they had this elaborate rabies cure that you could go to this basilica. You would sort of make a pilgrimage to this basilica. And they would, they would strap you to a metal ring. And then they would cut you across the forehead with like 
like a little scalpel, and then they would take a thread of the saint's sacred stole, and they would put it into the wound, and then they'd bind it up, and you'd be dressed all in white um, for, I think, like nine days. And then when that was done, you were supposedly cured of rabies. Um, I imagine these are mostly people who had been bitten by dogs and were worried that they would get rabies. Um, but didn't actually get it. Um, yeah, rabies cures, like a big part of the book is dedicated to a lot of like really, really crazy rabies cures. Um, and we, we keep finding out about more of them. Like, um, like uh, Abraham Lincoln, supposedly in the 1850s, took his son after he was bit by a dog, a suspect dog, to have him treated with what was called a mad stone, which was essentially a hairball from the stomach of a deer, um, and that they would harvest these, and these were believed to be uh, protective against rabies. And so you would, um, I, I'm not sure if you'd touch it to the wound or if you would just sort of touch it to the person's uh, but skin or something, but uh, but yeah, he took he took his son to have him treated with one of those. Um, come on, over there. Um, are there certain animals that are more susceptible to rabies, or are they all fair game? Any mammal can get rabies, but uh, there are strains of rabies associated with certain animals. Uh, we keep talking about the dog, and the dog has its own strain of rabies, which means a, a strain of rabies that has been co-evolving with the dog for a long time, and. Uh, Although it kills the dog dead, it, it does so slowly enough that the dog has an opportunity to infect others with rabies. And that, that's usually uh, part of that relationship between, between a particular strain of virus and its preferred host. It, it usually involves uh, killing, but a little slower killing so that that animal can serve as a vector to infect others with the disease. Uh, in North America, where we don't have dog rabies at all, we have four strains of, of rabies in wildlife. We have bat rabies, and we have raccoon fox and skunk rabies. Time for one more question? Come on, one more question. All right, there you go. Do you think the cats survive rabies that we know of? How much are they able to remember and articulate about what they experience? Not very much. So, so uh, Laurel's asking about the known survivors of rabies, of which uh, at this point there are about seven. Um, six who received an experimental treatment, uh, first uh, debuted in, in 2004 um, by Dr. Willoughby, an infectious disease pediatrician in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, and one who got better without the treatment. Um, the I, I've met one of these people. She's a girl of nine, and um, she she remembers uh, being bitten by the cat, although she didn't tell anyone about it at the time. Um, she remembers starting to feel sick and uh, being repulsed by liquids, and then it's all pretty hazy after that. And because the the treatment actually involves inducing a coma. Um, for, for the survivors who, who receive this treatment, there's of course a, a big chunk of time they, they don't know anything at all about. Um, so uh, unfortunately we don't have access to the survivor who didn't receive the treatment. Um, she was, uh, uh, according to, um, to, I guess, rumor, and, uh, that she, she was a homeless girl from Missouri who was um, just kind of passing through in Texas. Uh, she slept in a bat cave, had a bat encounter, and uh, presented m mostly as an outpatient to some Texas hospitals uh, for treatment of headaches and, and a little bit of, uh, of anger. <laughs> um, she, she never did get a coma. She, she was in and out of the hospital over a few weeks, um, but she was lost to follow up. Yeah. Um, all right, well, thank you guys so much for coming and listening to us. Um.